thank you that we can worship you freely here, Lord. We thank you that without risk of persecution or fear, Lord, that we can come before you, Lord, and uh, enter into worship before you, Father, and that we can get into your word. We thank you for your word, Father, that it's so powerful and so necessary in each of our lives, Father. We pray that you would touch us now. Use your word as that two-edged sword, Lord, to divide and to, to show, Lord, the thoughts and intents, Father, and do business with each of us, myself included tonight. Just thank you, God, for being faithful to us even when we're not faithful to you, and we thank you for your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles, please, or tap or swipe your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Now, last week, Bill got through 53 verse 7, I believe. Um, but I wanted to back up to 53.1 just a little bit and tag a few things. Uh, and then we'll get into the meat of it after we finish up 7. Isaiah 53, as we know, is all about Jesus. Uh, 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah wrote um, about him. The Lord revealed many things to him about the Messiah, who he calls the servant in this chapter. And verses 1 through 3 really deal with how mankind would view the Messiah. Hey, I forgot about that. So let's start with verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. I kind of, my original intention in going through reviewing, just so we have some flow from 53 to 54, reviewing a few of the things that Bill got through, my intention was sort of skip across the surface and, and then dig in after eight. But, you know, my heart and my mind kept being drawn to verse two, specifically the description of Jesus. This is probably the most detail we have as far as what his physical appearance is in Scripture, at least what his appearance was not. And Jesus was not a handsome man. It doesn't say he was ugly, but the verse makes it clear that he enjoyed no special advantage over people because of physical attraction, physical appearance. He was plain. He was average. It says he has no form or comeliness, meaning physical attractiveness. That's what comeliness means. And it says that when we see him, there's no beauty outwardly that we should desire him. He, he wasn't a white guy with blue eyes that were piercing and a strong jaw and perfect cheekbones and stuff like we see in Hollywood. He was a Jew, and he was a pretty average-looking guy. But the beauty of Jesus was far more than skin deep. We often judge based on superficial beauty. And we know that when the prophet Samuel visited Jesse, to discover which of his strapping, handsome young sons was going to be the next king of Israel, the Lord actually exhorted Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, where he said, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Alan Redpath, in my studies, I found a lot of good commentators that talked about this subject, and one of them I really liked was Alan Redpath. He wrote, These days it appears that we must dress up the gospel to make it attractive. We have to use the methods of technique which must be smart, well-presented, streamlined. There, is, there must be something about the presentation of the gospel that will appeal to people, to what is called the modern mind. I wonder if we stop to think that in our efforts to make the gospel message attractive, 
we are drawing a curtain across the face of Jesus in his humiliation. The only one who can make him attractive is the Holy Spirit. And when we as people try to dress up the gospel or put on a show, when we attempt to attract people to Jesus through comeliness or beauty, all we're really doing is throwing an embarrassed blanket over his humility, his simplicity, and his unassuming grace. We run the risk of shining a light on the messenger instead of the message. I thought it really appropriate um, in our body, because you know we're, we're making some changes around here. I mean, we're giving the old building a little bit of a facelift. We're kind of partying her up a little bit. It's normal. You know, we're also investing in technology and lights, cameras, live streaming software. You know what? We are blessed that we, through the power of the internet, the word can go out from this little body in Gridley, California, to a stage that is global in reach. In fact, we had people in Asia watching us a couple weeks ago. How cool is that? Some may be tempted to think, oh my goodness, we lost Bob, now everything's going to change. But you want to know the truth of the matter? We know it. Bob instructed us to modernize. I didn't know, I've never known a bigger tech geek than Bob Henderson. In fact, do you remember what Brad shared at his memorial where he sitting next to Bob in his bed, thinking Bob was sound asleep. Brad's hemming and hawing over, oh, do we go with the more expensive cameras? They're really going to work good, or do we save some money and get the cheaper ones? They don't do so much. And Bob heard everything. Brad, just buy the good ones. And praise God that one of the first beneficiaries of our venture into the 21st century was Bob himself. About the same time that we started live streaming was very close to the same time that Bob couldn't physically come to church anymore. And what a blessing it was. Blessing for him to still be with his family in a way, to be ministered to by the body that he spent so much time growing and leading. And a blessing to us to know that Pastor Bob's with us. He's, you know, enjoying it, you know, barring all the technical complications that we had, still have sometimes. But why update our technology? Frankly, we don't want to look and sound like a home video from 1984. We're not trying to be pretty. We're not trying to put on a show, but we also don't want to drive people away. We don't want that to be a distraction from what really matters, from what the message is all about. Don't let the stuff distract you guys. When you see lights and paint and stuff, that's not what it's about. It never has been and never will be. In fact, if, if there's anybody who is watching on YouTube or live stream, you want to know what we're about, we have these invitation cards that we talked about earlier. And if you look on the front of it, right under the logo, what does it say? It says what we're about, simply teaching the word of God simply. That's it. Acts 2, verse 42, says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. We see at the end of that same chapter, in the latter part of Acts 2, 47, where it says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The apostles were teaching the word. They were in fellowship. They were in prayer. Period. They didn't strive to add to the church. Who did it? God did. He added to the church daily as those who should be saved. That is the model that Bob led by, and that's the model that he taught us to lead by. That's not changing. No matter what you see, nothing changes. It's all about Jesus. So, that's been on my mind lately, and I think this verse about the appearance of Christ really tapped into that. So let's move on to verse 3. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. 
He was despised, and we did not esteem him. We heard Bill teach on these points last week. Man despised Jesus, and he didn't esteem him. After all, they would look for an earthly king and a man to free them from the yoke of Rome's oppression. They wouldn't esteem this plain-looking man as their Messiah. Surely, verse 4, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The word wounded there is translated as pierced through. I love that song. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. That's, this verse is where that song comes from. Now some name it and claim it wackos. That's an official theological term, wackos. They are going to try to teach from this verse that this verse proves that God gives us perfect health if we'll only have enough faith. That is a garbage doctrine. Not only do the people who teach that, they mistranslate the verb tense, sort of a theological detail, but important. But more plainly, they, that notion flies in the face of the suffering endured by saints throughout the Bible and human history. It's nonsense. We can't use this verse to cherry pick doctrines that we feel we want to be true. We are healed instead. We are healed, healed spiritually when we come to faith in Jesus and his restorative work on the cross. And we are healed eternally when our relationship with the Father is bridged by the blood of his Son. That's it. That's the meaning of it. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers he is silent, so he opened not his mouth. I may be tempted to condemn your sin and justify my own sin, but we can make no mistake. We have all turned, everyone, to his own way. We're all stubborn, stubborn dumb sheep in need of a shepherd. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Keep in mind that even though the prophet Isaiah writes these things in the past tense, we know obviously from history that it was 700 years from the foretelling of this until Jesus' time. And the account reads as if Isaiah were there to witness it in person even Jesus' calm demeanor and lack of self-defense. If you remember, it infuriated the authorities that he would not give an answer. But he fulfilled this scripture when he didn't. Many Jews are confounded by this chapter. Isaiah 53 is a thorn in their side, and for good reason. This is in Jewish scripture speaking of the messianic Christ. And there's no denying who this is about. As we saw in that video that Bill shared last week, we got to see how the Lord touched a Jewish man's heart and eventually his father's heart through this chapter, through Isaiah 53, how he thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, you know, the, looking at the New Testament, comparing it to this and saying, it, it's got to be Jesus. It's a great video. I don't know if you guys have seen it. If you haven't, I encourage you to go look it up. Uh, it really touches the heart when you get to see the perspective of a Jew, modern-day Jew, looking at the New Testament and seeing how it's been misrepresented in that culture versus the reality of the Scripture that they were taught growing up speaks of the man Jesus. And so check it out. It's really wonderful. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. 
Here we see Jesus' confinement before his death uh, foretold. It also speaks of him dying childless when the scripture says, and who will declare his generation? In verse 8, we finally get to see the ultimate end of this suffering servant that Isaiah is talking about. The servant will be cut off from the land of the living. It, It makes it clear now, finally, we understand He wouldn't simply be beaten, but he would die. And in using the phrase cut off, Isaiah Isaiah kind of mirrors what Daniel said in Daniel 9.26, where it says, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Once again, Isaiah emphasizes not just the who or the how, but also the why. It was for the transgressions of my people. Us. My sin nailed him there. Verse 9, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Jesus died a wicked sinner's death in the company of wicked sinners. The authorities fully intended to throw his body into the common criminal's grave that Romans used for those who were crucified, but... Remember your scripture, who was it that God touched and caused his heart to be softened? It was Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man. If you recall, he went before Pilate and begged for Jesus' body, and then he gave his own tomb up to Jesus so that he could be laid to rest there. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Verse 10. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. I wondered, reading this, how could it possibly have pleased the Lord to bruise him? We read in 2 Corinthians 5.19, in part it says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So the Father was in the Son, as he reconciled the world to himself. That was his goal, and that was his work through Jesus. But why why does it say that it pleased the Lord to bruise him? I think because it wasn't the physical agony that Jesus endured that pleased the Father. It was the end result of that agony and that death that pleased the Father. Jesus was obedient unto death. And notice it says also that God put him to grief. This was God's doing with Jesus' intentional obedience. God did it. Man did not do this. This was not Satan's victory. When Jesus Christ hung upon that cross to pay the debt that you and I couldn't pay, he was not helpless, but instead displayed the greatest strength the world has ever known. He wasn't a victim of politics or culture or of Satan's dastardly plan. He was the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he was conquering death. It's the greatest victory ever told. The offering for sin that we see in this verse is tied to the sacrificial sin offering that we see in Leviticus. And I think it's pretty fair to assume that Jesus dreaded becoming the sin offering much more than the physical pain he would endure. We don't really read about him crying out in physical pain. But when he who knew no sin became sin, he cried out in Matthew 27, 46, where it says, In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the most painful moment, I believe. That was what he agonized over in the Garden of Gethsemane because he knew what he would have to endure. If you think about it, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead, has existed as one for eternity past and will exist as one for eternity future. Never separated except for this one moment in time where God the Father turned his face away from his Son. That's pretty heavy. 
when you think about the amount of abuse that Jesus took, this is what really hurt the most. So next, we read in this verse that he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. After the completed work on the cross, Jesus would rise again as foretold. His days would be prolonged into eternity and would be prosperous in perfection. He would see us, his seed, his spiritual descendants. I know he thought about me when he was on that cross. I know he bore the weight of my guilt. And I know he thought about each of you. And he thought about everybody. Whether they're aware of it or not, his thoughts turned to each of us. Over the eons, he knew us before we were formed and he thought of us. Now we're about to get to the good part. The uplifting part, I should say. He shall see the labor of his soul, verse 11, and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus would look upon his work, including the agony of his soul, and be satisfied. It would all be worth it. He would have no regrets. In fact, I'd venture to say that if only one of us needed saving, he'd do the same just for one of us. Isaiah here also foretells the justification of the many through this servant. Jews and Gentiles both are now a part of the fold. Only through knowing Jesus as our Savior by faith, through his death on the cross and the resurrection thereafter, can we be justified before God. Finally, now at the end of chapter 53, we get to see the reward for all this labor. And it says in verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. When Jesus hung on the cross, remember one of the things he said? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even in the midst of dying, what many would argue, the most horrible death, he still made intercession for the transgressors. Such was his heart. And in this verse, Isaiah is shown the inheritance that Jesus will share among those who are strong in him. As backed up further in Scripture, we read in Romans 8, 16 through 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. He was poured out completely for us, labeled a criminal for us, and bore our sin for us. And what do we get in return? Eternity, in glory, in inheritance, we become royalty in God's kingdom because he did all the work. That's a pretty good deal for us. Isaiah chapter 54. Now, after 39 chapters of illustrating the sins of Israel and declaring severe judgment against them, Isaiah has moved into several chapters of reassurance and a promise of return and restoration after the Babylonian exile. Chapter 53, as we just read, as well as the latter verses of 52, some question the chapter break up there, uh, those continue to prophesy the coming Messiah. Chapter 54 now likens Israel to a wife being restored by her husband, Jehovah, and a barren woman who goes on to bear many children, her grief turned to joy. This is to me one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible because it is so rich with the mercy and the love and the comfort of the Lord. He's dealing with a stubborn and obstinate and sinful people that are going to experience judgment. But even in the midst of his wrath, there is such an outpouring of love and comfort. Of chapter 54, Spurgeon wrote, Try and suck all the sweetness that you can out of this chapter while we read it. 
The personal application of a promise to the heart by the Holy Spirit is that which is wanted. The honey in Jonathan's wood never enlightened his eyes until he dipped the point of his rod into it and tasted it. Try and do the same. This chapter is the wood wherein every bough doth drip with virgin honey. Sip, taste, and be satisfied. Verse 1. Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes, for you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. What a promise to a people who are going to go into decline. In ancient cultures, and notably in Israel, a barren woman was the subject of shame and disgrace and ridicule in the community. Here the Lord likens captive Israel to that barren woman who, after suffering desolation so long, would have more children than the married woman who was never barren. In much the same way as a barren woman in, the, in that time carried a huge load of shame, so also the people of Israel suffered shame, humiliation, and disgrace in their captivity. Isaiah foretold it. The Lord encourages them that their shame and desolation would end and that they would multiply. In fact, the Lord goes on not only to tell them and promise that they would no longer be barren, but that they will have to enlarge their tents. They'll have to stretch out their dwellings and expand to the right and to the left. And he promises that their descendants would inherit the nations and fill cities that were once laid bare. They're not just going to return to survive. They're going to thrive, and God will see to it. Do not fear, verse 4, for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowed widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused says your God. I really love the story of Hosea. And just like Hosea, who loved his unfaithful wife, Gomer, with an undying love, so God loves his wayward bride, Israel. For so long, Israel broke the Lord's heart as she committed a spiritual adultery, which is also called idolatry. The nation of Israel would often lay with any one of a number of false idols. And all the while her husband, Jehovah, stood ready to redeem her and take her back. Come what may, whatever hurt she might cause, his love never fails. His unfailing love is illustrated beautifully here. He says, come back to me, my beloved. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. I will not remember your approach or your sin. I am your maker your husband and your God and your redeemer. Come home and be comforted in my arms. There are a great many single women who put a great emphasis on finding a husband. Naturally so. So much of their energy is spent on finding the one who will meet all their needs and fulfill their heart's desires. Truth be told, ladies, if you'll let him, our Heavenly Father will be a husband to you. Do you desire comfort, strength, love, security? He provides that and so much more. In fact, there isn't a human husband that has ever existed who could complete you like our God can. If you'll let him. By the same token, there are a great many married people who put a great deal of emphasis on their earthly spouses. And in turn, many feel disappointment and hurt 
for unmet expectations or needs gone unfulfilled. Ladies and gentlemen, the message is clear. The lesson is this. If you are only looking to your earthly partners for fulfillment, you will continually be disappointed. God didn't design us to complete one another. A threefold cord is not easily broken. Only the Lord our God can complete you. He can only complete me. Never leave him out of the marriage. So now Isaiah continues on with God's words of comfort for his bride who went astray. In verse 7, For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. Now through this time, the Lord never really fully forsook Israel, yet he knows how their hearts will feel under captivity. They will feel like they're abandoned. Seventy years is a long time in our perspective. He will allow them to feel forsaken for a short time, but all along he has always been there, ready to rescue. And after this short time of feeling abandoned, the Lord assures his people that he will redeem them in his everlasting kindness and great mercy. It's a good time to point out that we, when we feel abandoned, we need to remember and rely upon his word, which says in Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise back then. That's a promise now. I try to teach my daughters to do their best in any situation, to not let how they feel overwrite what they know. Easier said than done a lot of times, especially with little girls. But no matter how we feel, what we know is what we read in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Another promise from way back then, still a promise for right now. And in fact, that verse in Jeremiah that we use for daily comfort in our lives and our walks, at least I do, that was also written to the children of Israel who would be in 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Speaking to the same people, speaking the same comfort from the same God. Verse 9, for this, for this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. Just as God promised that the waters of the great flood would not cover the earth forever, but would recede, so he promises Israel that his wrath will subside and his anger and rebuke be removed from them. Flood waters receive, but mountains and hills will not. But the Lord says that even if the mountains depart and the hills be removed, his kindness to and his covenant with his people will never depart. God is God, and when he said he won't leave you, he means it. O oh, you afflicted one, verse 11, tossed with tempest and not comforted, Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. Our God is a God of perfect wrath, but he's also a God of perfect love, isn't he? And he truly cares for the afflicted and not comforted. He promises not only to hold and comfort them, but to lavish riches upon them, be they physical or even more, more valuable, spiritual riches. 
And when we feel afflicted and tossed and not comforted, remember that he who comforts is near. Try to remember what you know within the tempest of how you feel. Let me say that again. Try to remember what you know within the tempest of what you feel. Verse 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. This, oh my goodness, as a parent. This would be of special comfort for the afflicted exiles of Israel. As parents, we may worry for our own safety and peace, but we are truly terrified for the same for our children. If I go without, that's fine. But if my children are threatened, everything stops. That's the parent's heart. That's God's heart. And God sees fit to ease their fears and proclaim to them their children's godly upbringing. And as a result, the subsequent great peace that their children will have. Oh, what a burden lifted from the heart of those parents, from the heart of those people, knowing that their generations behind them would be at peace. In righteousness, verse 14, you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. After the fear and oppression of exile in Babylon, the promise of being far from oppression, fear, and terror would be a sweet promise indeed. And indeed, verse 15, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. Here the Lord proclaims his sovereignty. He is the one who created the blacksmith. He is the one who created the spoiler to destroy. In the same manner, he is the one with the power to protect, as we see now in the last verse of the chapter, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Our righteousness has never and will never come from us. It is derived solely and completely from him. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, if you remember what the word says about it. And no weapon formed against them shall prosper. The same promise applies to us so many thousands of years later. These are our heritage as servants of the Lord. Note that the verse does not say that no weapon shall be formed against you. It implicitly tells us that when, not if, but when a weapon is formed against us, it shall not prosper. God may remove that weapon from the situation in your life. He might. He also in his sovereignty, sovereignty, may allow such a weapon to strike, to cut, to bruise, to cause injury. And if he does, as believers, we can be assured that he will use that wound to bring about a greater healing and a bigger blessing in our lives than we would have otherwise had without that wound. The point is that God is sovereign. God is all-powerful, and whether the weapon is removed or the injury it causes is used to glorify him, that weapon shall not prosper, period. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Isaiah's word that you inspired him to write, Lord, and that hundreds of years later, every single word, every single line has been proven true, Lord. And even now we can hold on to the promises that you gave your people back then, Lord. Cause us to be those servants who are strong in you, Father. Go before us as we go about the rest of our week. And Lord, help us to glorify you in what we say, what we do, what we think. And Lord, we thank you, God, for being able to be here and being able to be in your word freely. In Jesus' name, amen.